my name is Paul Abatella and I'm here to talk to you about using open source as part of a system safety mechanism. Now I've been working with complex software systems since 1990, starting with banking system mainframes, and then PCs, and mobile phones, and most recently Linux based systems in automotive. Most of my development experience has been at the system or platform level, but over the years I've become more and more focused on software engineering processes and how we use them. I first started working with open source software in a mobile phone context, working with platforms like Mego and Android, which have Linux under the hood. But the thing I really enjoyed about these projects was the way we used open source tools to improve and extend what we could do. And I've been passionate about that ever since. This passion is what led me to join CodeThink in 2019, where my focus has been on safety and open source. At first, this involved a lot of time learning about safety from the first principles and trying to decipher the safety standards and then thinking about how we could apply these to open source software and development processes. Now, I've been able to do a lot of that thinking in public as part of open source projects such as Trustable and Elisa and in talks like this one. But last year, I was finally able to apply some of that thinking in practice, working with my colleagues to qualify an open source tools integration using ISO 26262, which is the automotive safety standard. This talk is about extending the principles from that to safety systems that include open source components. So what do we actually mean by safety? Well, this term can mean a number of different things in the software world, so I've included some definitions here. To be clear, I'm talking about functional safety, which is a discipline concerned with those parts of a system that are intended to protect us from harm, that is injury or death, when that system or a related system malfunctions. And what's a safety mechanism? Well, you can see the ISO 26262 definition of it here, but that really boils down to two roles, either transitioning to or maintaining a safe state or detecting and alerting a user or other safety mechanism when a fault occurs. An example you might be familiar with is a watchdog, which you can implement either in software or in an external hardware device. And its job is quite simple. It's about detecting when a software process that we care about is hanging. Or in more complex implementations, using a challenge response interaction with that process to verify that it's actually doing what it's supposed to be doing. But when we have one of these safety mechanisms or a safety related system, how do we decide what is safe? And there's two different parts to this. There's the technical solution itself uh, and what, what are the hazards or risks that we're trying to avoid with it? And how does the solution work to prevent or mitigate them? And how is it integrated into the wider system context? But we also care about how we can be confident in that solution. How can we be confident that it actually addresses the safety goals that it's supposed to, that there aren't uh, some additional faults that it might introduce that could compromise that? And how can we be confident in its implementation? Has it been specified correctly? Has it been verified correctly? Does it actually do what it's supposed to do? And also, how can we be confident in the organizations responsible for, for doing all this, for implementing it and for verifying it? And for that, we look to evidence of their safety culture and for quality and safety management processes. Now, the established answers to a lot of these questions, which you'll see enshrined in the safety standards, have been around for 30 or 40 years, and in some cases they're starting to show signs of their age. And this is something that Nancy Leverson talks about in her book Engineering a Safer World, in which she talks about how the fast pace of technological change and a reduced ability to learn from experience with accidents, as well as a changing nature of those accidents, is presenting a challenge to those traditional safety approaches. In particular, she focuses on new types of hazards which arise from the increasing complexity and coupling between systems and between safety systems and how that is defying the ability of some of the traditional fault analysis techniques to identify those hazards and how to prevent them. But there are some software specific challenges too, and not just because we have increasingly complex software functions and systems involved in our safety related systems, there's also a proliferation of components and dependencies involved in those systems. And they use pre-existing and open source software instead of purpose-built software for that particular safety system. And when it comes to open source, there are some additional perceived challenges. 
there's a lack of an entity to take legal responsibility and licenses that explicitly dis disavow liability. And components are often not developed for a specific purpose because they they value immediacy of use, being able to uh, apply something to a, a variety of different cases, adapt it and rapidly iterate it. And that means that formal requirement specifications are almost always lacking. And FOSS communities don't operate like commercial organisations. They don't have management processes that we see described in the safety standards, and they can't even command or, or direct the people uh, developing them to do the particular tasks. So they can't ensure that particular types of work are done. And this means that they may have informal or inconsistent development models. They may apply good engineering practices, but not as part of a formal process. And so you can't be certain that those practices are being applied consistently. So how can we meet these challenges and how can we achieve safety certification for a system that involves open source software? Well, with my colleagues at CodeThink and as part of the ELISA project, I've been working on a new approach to safety, which we've been calling RAFIA, which stands for Risk Analysis, Fault Injection and Automation. Now this involves using top-down hazard analysis to identify the risks involved in using open source software as part of our system and the constraints that we need to put in place to deal with those risks. We then use automated construction and testing techniques to verify requirements that are based on those constraints and software fault injection to validate the tests but also any system level safety mechanisms that we've introduced to deal with risks that we can't manage in the open source software itself. To do this, we've been using a methodology called System Theoretic Process Analysis or STPA to drive our software engineering processes. This was a methodology that was developed by Nancy Leveson at MIT. Our first application of these principles was to an open source tools uh, integration called Deterministic Construction Service, which is designed to create a change controlled and reproduced software construction and verification environment that we can use to verify our software. We used RAFIA to achieve an ISO 26262 tool qualification for this reference integration. But our next step is to apply RAFIA to the systems that we're building that have open source components in them. But what I'm going to talk about today is the kind of roles and responsibilities that open source can have in a safety related system and some of the challenges involved in integrating it with other components. And to do that, we're going to look at a integrating with actually a, a proprietary software safety mechanism which is the ARM software test libraries which are used to detect hardware faults in, in a CPU. And we work with ARM to investigate an approach to integrating these uh, with a, a Linux based system and, and the purpose of this uh, exploration was to understand the role of, of FOSS as part of system integration, the challenges of integrating the software test library with, with Linux using other open sources as part of the solution uh, and also managing the safety integrity claims we want to make about such components using open source tools. So what is a, a safety test library? Um, so this is an example of, of using software to mitigate hardware level risks. Um, so when you have a, a, a hardware component uh, of a safety system uh, such as a, a CPU, you want to understand the kind of faults that might occur in that and what you can do to mitigate them. And not all of those can be mitigated in hardware. So what we have here is, is a suite of tests that verify the correct operation of the processor. It was first introduced uh, by ARM for the Cortex A53. Uh, and the idea is that you run it on boot and then periodically during operation of your system so that you can detect permanent hardware faults uh, and also latent faults, faults that are kind of waiting to manifest um, uh, while the system is running. Uh, from a safety standard perspective, this is about increasing what is called the, the diagnostic coverage for hardware faults, and it's a key requirement uh, for safety certification. Now this doesn't achieve safety by itself, but as we were saying earlier about safety mechanisms, you can combine it with other mechanisms for 
active protection. So for example, you could trigger another mechanism to activate a safe state when you detect a hardware fault. And this kind of, of principle is an alternative to having hardware redundancy. So instead of having multiple pieces of hardware running in parallel to make sure that you can always rely on them, you can understand the reliability of a, of a single piece of hardware by running some software tests. Now there's a number of particular technical challenges involved uh, in, uh, in using and in integrating STL. And the first is that we need to run these tests during system operation. Uh, and we want to run them on, on all of the cores in the CPU. And we need to do that within a, a specific time frame, which is called a fault tolerance time interval in the, the standards. And this is really to, to give us time to activate, activate a mitigation. So if we want to activate uh, another safety mechanism that puts us into a safe state, we need time to activate that when a fault is detected. But it also means that it has potential to interfere with other running software, which would include, of course, uh, any safety related software that we're running. And it, the other problem with these tests is that they require the highest system privilege level to execute. And that's because they test some of the processor functions that are only available at that level. Now, in ARM architecture, there's a number of different levels of, of privilege um, described in the in the trust zone architecture. Uh, the programs running in, in Linux user space, for example, would be at what's called EL0. The kernel itself operates at EL1. Above that, you have uh, EL2, which is if you have a, a hypervisor system as part as part of your of your device. And then the highest level, EL3, is, is reserved for trusted um, sort of for services only. But when we're thinking about this, it's not just the technical challenges, it's also the safety challenges. How do these technical solutions fit into the wider safety argument? What do we do when we detect a, a problem? And, and how can this safety mechanism interfere with the software and with other safety mechanisms? But we also have some challenges associated with using open source components. And the first of these is software license restrictions. Now, Linux is licensed with the GPL, which places certain requirements and responsibilities on, on the, uh, the end user. Um, STL has a more restrictive commercial license, which means that combining the two can be tricky. Um, there are some strategies for uh, combining, for integrating non-free components into the kernel, um, but the Linux kernel community generally regards these as, as harmful and, and undesirable. And in any event, in, in this case, we know that we can't run all of the STL tests within the kernel itself because some of them need to write, run at a higher privilege level. So we'll need to look at a, a different way to, to manage this. But we might also have some challenges associated with building with open source tools. Uh, safety certified components often require the use of qualified tools. Um, now, these tools might potentially be based on, on an open source tools such as GCC, um, but they might be based on a specific older version of the compiler, or they might assume that, that we're using specific proprietary tools. And using different tools to comp compile different components and then integrating those components can result in unexpected behavior. So how did we approach integrating STL with Linux? And how did we address some of these challenges? Well with we turned to another piece of open source software which is the trusted firmware or TFA project which is an open source reference implementation of firmware for ARM trust zone uh, now this is primarily concerned with security uh, and, and a kind of secure world concept but for, from a safety perspective it also has some very useful functions uh, which are concerned with system initialization and system management. And the particular function we were interested in were, was a method for invoking a secure monitor running within that firmware from an operating system. But it's also concerned with the initialization of the system, so operations that happen during the boot up process before the operating system is even invoked. So we'll be able to run the SDL tests on boot to make sure that the hardware is uh, all functional 
uh, before we even start the operating system. And then when the operating system, in this case Linux, is up and running, it can call back into TFA to run the STL tests. So this means that we have an indirect integration with Linux. Um, rather than integrating the, the library into Linux, we're integrating it with trusted firmware. And to do that, we have a new service which we added to TFA that will run the STL tests. And the STL tests themselves are implemented in a library which we can link in with that service. And that just means that we then need a way for the um, processes running on the operating system to in invoke those tests. And to do that, we implemented a, a simple character device driver, which lets us send a message to TFA and, and invoke that service via the SMC instruction, which is a, a low level assembly language instruction that there's already support for in the kernel so that we can run our STL tests. And this means that we're running those tests at the correct privilege level at EL3 because they're running uh, in a secure monitoring application within the trusted firmware. Now to actually control when those tests run, we have a number of test processes running on the operating system in Linux. And these are running in user space and we can assign or give the, each one a, an affinity for a particular core so that we're sure that we're running our tests on each of the cores. So how we actually manage running of those uh, test processes and, and when the tests are executed is, is a slightly bigger challenge because we need to run that within our fault tolerant time interval. Um, but the important thing is that because we're splitting them up into individual processes, we can manage those processes individually more importantly, the operating system can manage the scheduling of those processes around the other tasks that it needs to do, and which would, could include some safety related functions or some non safety related functions that the operating system needs to, to run in order to support whatever our system is intended to do. But it's important to note that this is just a, a proof of concept implementation, it's about understanding the technical challenges uh, in integrating the uh, STL uh, library in this way uh, and just establishing the feasibility of it as, as a way of invoking those um, those tests. If we wanted to use this as part of an actual safety mechanism, then we need to do an analysis of this integration method as well. So we actually need to look at the different software components involved in invoking uh, the STL, the different circumstances in which that's going to, to happen and what could possibly go wrong. So to give an ex obvious example, those test processes that we have running in, in user space, um, we, we don't want them to interfere with the uh, other things that are running on, on the system, um, but we also need them to, to run within our uh, fault tolerant time interval. So how can we ensure that, that they do that? How can we ensure that um, they're a high enough priority that they run frequently, but not at so high a priority that they interfere with the actual function of the system. And similarly, there's a whole sequence of steps to invoke the, the library. Uh, it's not just a simple function call from the, from the test process. So there's a number of things that could go wrong uh, on that pathway. And we need to look at each of those and understand how that might be compromised and how we could ensure that we have confidence in that pathway. So we then did a prototype implementation of, of this approach for the Raspberry Pi 4, um, which we were able to do because there was existing support in trusted firmware for, for that hardware platform, and because it was using the correct processor architecture for the, the STL uh, version that we were integrating, and that meant that we could confirm the viability of our approach by running the tests on boot, by running the tests um, from user space via, via our, um, our invocation method and, and start to understand uh, what the technical challenges were in more detail um, and, and just confirm that the tests were able to run as we expected. But to go further with this, uh, we, we want to integrate it into, into a, a reference system, not just a prototype. Um, and we made a start on, on that by using a demo platform that we'd 
developed for a presentation at OSS Japan, um, which is an illustration of a, um, a rear-facing camera application uh, running in parallel with uh, an IVI, um, which we for which we were using uh, the AGL reference um, IVI. Uh, and this was built using the deterministic construction service tool that I was talking about earlier, which meant that we could confirm that we have a, a controlled and reproducible way to, to construct all of our components uh, and an environment within which to verify them. Uh, and this meant that we had a, a basis for investigating the application integration strategies um, that, that we need to, to explore uh, to understand exactly how this safety mechanism would operate as part of a, a wider system. So having developed our prototype uh, safety mechanism involving open source, how would we then go on to use something like that as part of a safety related system and how would we then certify that system? So to do this we would first need to use our deterministic construction service uh, integration to help us to specify control the way that we're using our open source components. Uh, this means having a specific integration and configuration of those software components which we're storing in, in Git repository alongside the source code for those components um, to have that within a, a CI environment within which we can perform verification of those components but also of the integrated system itself uh, and also in which we can control changes to the integration, to, to the source code itself, and to the tests that we're implementing to do that verification. And we're also going to use this environment to coordinate uh, our collection of evidence for these various engineering processes, which is what we need to satisfy the work product requirements in standards like ISO 26262, which are all about building up a body of evidence to support why we have confidence in the processes that we've followed in the constructing our system. But in order to do that, we actually need to understand what those requirements are. Uh, and this is where we're going to use Raffia to analyze the role of the open source software in the system and use that to specify exactly what we need it to do so that we can then verify that. So we first need a, a system architecture, which lets us understand what role our, our software has within that system. We're going to use STPA to document the, the safety goals uh, associated with that system and analyze the associated risks. And, and from that, we want to identify component level and system level constraints that we need in place to manage that risk. And in some cases, those constraints are going to be implemented by our open source software. So we're essentially going to need to show that its design and its behavior uh, meets those constraints. In other cases, uh, that's going to be part of the, the wider systems responsibilities uh, to, to, to manage risks that we might not be able to address in the open source software itself. And we're going to derive tests from these uh, constraints to, to verify our, our software, but also to verify its behavior as part of the system. So we really want to, to derive system level tests here. And to give us confidence in those tests, we also want to use software fault injection to validate them so that when something fails, the test actually detects that the failure has happened. Um, but we also want to validate our external safety measures in order to make sure that, that they're working. So when the system is up and running and we have a detection mechanism such as STL as part of our system, how can we be certain that it actually detects a, a fault and uh, invokes the appropriate safety me measure to, to deal with that? Um, we can use software fault injection uh, to, uh, to explore what happens when our software components fail here. You'd need to use hardware level fault injection uh, to, to do that um, for, for the hardware components to detect those hardware failures. But ultimately we also want to automate this testing and the fault injection where, where possible using our, our DCS instance so that we can manage all of this as, as part of our coordinated engineering process and, and collect all the evidence we need uh, about it that we can then use 
to certify our system. So what do I want you to take away from this talk? Well, the first thing is that safety is a system property, which might sound like an obvious thing to say, but it's easy to lose sight of this when we're talking about certifying individual components and then putting them together to make a safe system. Safe components alone don't make a safe system. To have that, we need to understand their role in relation to each other and in relation to the system's safety goals. Only then can we be sure that we're achieving those goals. What certification of components can give us is confidence in the safety integrity of those components, which means that we understand what they're intended for and why we can have confidence in the development processes followed to achieve and verify that purpose. And historically, this has been a problem for FOSS components because the materials typically provided by the open source development communities don't always give us that clarity of purpose. However, that doesn't mean that we can't use open source components as part of our safety related systems, provided that we, as system integrators, are prepared to specify how we're using those components in our system, analyze the risks that are involved in doing so, and show how we are managing or mitigating those risks and why we have confidence in our specific integration and safety measures. An open source can also contribute to this in the form of tools to support the software engineering processes that we use to achieve that safety integrity. But open source can do something else as well. It can help to promote understanding of safety topics and safety concepts. We can use reference implementations like the trusted firmware one that we looked at in this example to illustrate how components are intended to be used and integrated, what risks engineers need to consider when integrating them in their own systems, and how these can be mitigated. And open source projects like ELISA can help to identify these common risks and mitigations, so that engineers using open source components can learn from previous safety analysis and build on that, instead of having to start from scratch every time. To my mind, that desire, the desire to share our work our hard-won knowledge so that others don't have to reinvent the wheel is what open source is all about. Thanks for listening and if you have, you, you have any questions I'd be happy to answer them now.